over to the man of God of the hour. All right. Thank God for Pastor Tanisha and to all of you. Uh, certainly God bless. We're going to go to Psalms chapter 126 this morning. Uh, we have been for the whole year working through uh, a, a series of messages uh, as a part of the theme for the way. Uh, reclaim, restore, and reimagine. And we spend a lot of time on the reimagining part, and we spend a lot of time on the reclaim part. And so I do feel led for the next couple of months as we uh, make our way, hopefully, through the fourth quarter of the pandemic to help position us as a church and as a people to imagine how do we restore that which has been lost? How do we restore that which has slipped away from us? Um, how do we restore the very realities and the sensibilities and the expectations that for many of us in the last 15, 18 months or so have literally been uprooted. And if you're like me, uh, this pandemic has uh, reminded myself and so many of us of the fragility of life, the, 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 the idea that life does not have permanence, um, that you could be living your life doing the best you can and a pandemic will come out of nowhere and literally change the course, not just of your life, but of literally all of creation. It reminds us, it should remind us at the very least, that we are a people that are at all times contingent. We are a people that are, are at all times in need of a savior, in need of a helper, in need of someone to do things for us that we could not do for ourselves. Can I get a witness in here, somebody? And so this idea that God wants to restore, God seeks to restore. God is in the restoration business. Uh, you ought to just pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm glad God is in the restoration business. Amen. Amen. So Psalms 126 is, is one of these passages as I was thinking through um, the, the, the way for us to, to, to dive into these uh, conversations and into this season of discipleship around restoration. Uh, and I do plan every Wednesday for this month to, to lead a pastoral study at 7 p.m. on uh, Zoom. And so we're going to invite you all to sign up for that. We're not going to stream it on Facebook because we want it to be a family conversation. So, but we do need you to sign up. Somebody say amen. Amen. And we're going to have a time of just pastoral teaching and give you a chance to ask questions. And we go down the, the, the rabbit hole of the word of God. Uh, but as I was thinking about the passages of scripture, this one passage jumped out to me. It usually is preached during the time of Lent, uh, during the time where we are highlighting the journey that the people of God are always being asked to make to the place of God. And so Psalms 126 is a passage that uh, is called one of the Psalms of the Ascent, which means that when the people of Israel, the, the faithful, are going to the temple, they had these different psalms that they used to sing on the way or chant on the way. Um, some of you all uh, uh, came with me. I think Pastor Tanisha or maybe, yeah, I think Pastor Tanisha came to me when I had to speak at the the Jewish synagogue for their high holy days. And uh, I was one of the, the only speakers to speak during their call it their Rosh Hashanah. It's like their version of Easter or Christmas. And during the service, they broke out into these chants, what we would call chants, but they had drums attached to it. And folks began to, to just twirl around the, 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 the facility. And, and they were just breaking out into jubilant uh, chants and songs, and, 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 and seeing that gave me a, a picture of what it looked like when the children of Israel perhaps were making their ascent to the temple, and they needed to help their journey be um, littered with songs of joy and songs of remembrance and testimonies, and how many know sometimes uh, developing a song along the way, having a testimony, having the ability to recount the goodness of the Lord. Uh, it indeed helps the journey to feel uh, that much more bearable. And so I want you to transport yourself into this text as someone who has just endured 
a great journey that has been littered with difficulty and trial. For some of you, you don't even have to imagine that hard. Amen. It's, it's like I'm there right now, Pastor Mike. Amen. And, and I want you to imagine that these words are rolling off of your lips as a declaration of what our journey not only feels like, but what it could be along the way. The scripture says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, Psalms 126 verse 1, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. And then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk for a few moments uh, uh, with the, the, the theme for the next several weeks about restore. Uh, today we'll talk about recycled tears. Recycled tears. God bless the word of God that has been read for us. The people of God, we ask you to hide your word in our heart so we will not sin against you and let the anointing that makes teaching and preaching easy may it rest upon me and the hearers of your word and we'll say, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Recycle tears. One of the most profound lessons we learn from creation, from that which God has gifted to all of us, is there are very few things, if anything, that is created in its natural state that goes to waste. We've heard it over and over and over again in the biblical text. It's preached to us our whole lives, right? That all things, somebody say all things, work together for the good of them who love God and are called according to God's purpose. And while it sounds good in the church house, how many of you know there's some parts of your life where you're trying to figure out, God, how can I get this thing out of my experience? Amen. And say, God, I know you said some things don't go to waste, but surely you don't know my life. You don't understand the struggle, the journey I've had to endure. And, 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 and how, God, can this be something of value in my journey? Well, the gift of, of, of a life with God, a life with God that is conscience to us, is that we know that nothing that God brings or allows in our life is ever beyond the reach of God's redemption. And it really puts a frame on the journey that we all, I believe, have had to endure uh, because we have had to uh, uh, encounter certain realities during this pandemic that have literally changed the course of our collective lives. COVID has become a a a a a water uh, mark point in history. There are certain things that every generation people will remember, right? Amen. I, I thought for me the the biggest uh, life life altering era of my 45 years of living would have been the crack cocaine era, because it is during those years of the 90s where some of us who are old enough. I was only about 15, 16, 17 during that time, but I was old enough to remember what it was like before crack hit, that we could go outside and play in a park. We all were at head starts, amen, with the Sister Hill and Sister Wendy. Somebody say amen. Don't mean to date you that, that bad, Sister Daisy, amen. <laughs> we all used to be able to be in spaces, and it still felt like everybody was looking out for one another. So my mind, you know, I was thinking, well, God, perhaps you kept me alive, kept my mind, kept my heart. You, 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 you helped me to navigate through my own trauma so I could be a, 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 one of these carriers of the memory of life before crack. 
And I think that is still the case that, you know, as I work with so many uh, individuals who are caught up in the, the violence and the, and the health, uh, the unhealthy uh, ways of living, uh, you know, I can tap into that. But now COVID, COVID-19 has literally created a, 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 a radical disruption in the flow of our lives. Amen. As I look at some of you here today in the sanctuary, all of us have on masks. Amen. And we all will now have to remember a time when we did not have to wear a mask. Somebody say amen. amen. Some of the young people are going to grow up with, with only seeing people wearing a mask. And they will not even understand that there was a time when we did not need to wear a mask. They won't understand why are there uh, 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 sanitizer stations at every single entrance of a building you go into. Amen. There was a time where people didn't wash their hands and didn't have no worry about it. Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes. Some of y'all may want to forget that era. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. But the whole point is that there are times where the vicissitudes of life create such a radical disruption that in many cases, what we remember the most about those shifts are the tears that flow from the acknowledgement of change. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I, 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 I you know, and, and I, I, I was I was taken by this scripture, uh, particularly when it talked about sowing in tears and reaping with shouts of joy and going out weeping and bearing the seed for sowing. And I was just I was I was I was struck by the, the, the way that tears are often the marker for our memories of both the past, the present, and perhaps even the future. But how many of you know not all tears are created equal? Uh, I, I, I was, I was, I was um, drawn to uh, Sister Rose Lynn Fisher's uh, uh, work called The Topography of Tears. It was a powerful, powerful uh, study and demonstration done in the Smithsonian. And, and, and Dr. Fisher collected, examined, and photographed more than 100 tears from both herself and a handful of other volunteers, including a newborn baby. And what Dr. Fisher did is she captured the tears and she allowed them to dry and she put them under a microscope. And scientifically, we know that tears are divided into three types based on their origin. Tears of grief, joy, grief and joy are called psychic tears. Uh, tears that are uh, released continuously in our eyes to help clean our cornea are called basal tears. And then tears that are a result of irritant, dust, onion vapors, or tear gas are called reflexive tears. And many of you did not know that your tears are actually telling a story. A story about our journey. And as she began to, to, to pull these tears apart, and I don't know if you have that slide with the topography of tears, but, but I, I'd love for you to throw it up here because it's a very interesting and powerful uh, uh, description or picture of tears. Uh, I, I was able to take at least five uh, pictures of tears, and, and, and one uh, picture had a, 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 a pattern of tears that were about timeless reunions. That when you come together in a reunion, your body produces a certain kind of tear to mark a reunion. Then there was another expression of tears when you are going through times of change. And the change is so traumatic that your body produces a certain kind of tear. Then it had a, a picture of tear, a tears when you are going through an ending and a new beginning. That your body produces a certain kind of tear. It had a picture of tears that were shed during times of grief and loss. That literally your body is producing a certain kind of tear. 
And when you laugh yourself to a place where you start crying, how many have one of those laughing fits? My, my, my baby, Nyla, she's one of them kind of laughers. Amen. She'll start laughing, and then you look at her and say, it cannot be that serious. But the, this girl will produce tears that will flow down her face, and, 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 and the tears of laughter are these tears on this side. All of these different kinds of tears being produced. And it just made me think about how tears represent grief and pain. They represent joy. They represent new beginnings. But what tears remind us all of is that we are still tender. There is a part of us that can still be penetrated by the experiences of life. It signifies that you have a place within you that has not yet reached a point of no return. It signifies that where you are crying, the tears may be telling you uh, a few things about what you must do next. That if you are crying because of the compassion that is elicited by those who are unhoused, those tears may be giving you some direction. That if you are crying tears because of the trauma you've just endured, those tears may be giving you some direction. That as a matter of fact, tears are a sign that the heart of God is still flowing through you. Because I want to believe that before you ever shed a tear, God has already been weeping over the conditions that have penetrated the tender part of our lives. Oh, somebody ought to say that. I'm glad God still shed tears for us. Amen. And, and, and I want to I believe that when we stop shedding tears, we have lost our proximity, not just to God, but to the hurt among us. That we may have become so calcified. So impenetrable that not only are we unable to resonate with the pain of others, but we may be more far from God than we thought we have become. And it is in this way, child of God, that I want you to know that part of the task in the season of restoration is to first understand that there is no wasted moment in your journey, that our journeys will have highs and lows. They will go through the waters and the fires. They will go through the smooth and the rough places. But even in the midst of that journey, I hear God saying, whether you shed tears of joy, whether you shed tears of pain, whether you shed tears of grief, I can recycle and restore everything that one may have thought is beyond redemption. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. And so it is in this way, child of God, that this theme of restoration in Psalms 126 is prominently used throughout the, the Psalms of Ascent. Why? Because God is always trying to teach the children of Israel. And dare I say, we who are followers of the way, that God will meet the people of God in the midst of our journey. That while it is great to have a curated space like this sanctuary, where we know that God will show up when the people of God gather, where two or three are gathered in the name of the Lord, that God will be in the midst. We can be confident that if I can't find God anywhere, I can find God in the sanctuary. But how many of you know there is also another depth of your walk and your journey where God wants you to know that wherever you may be on your journey, that God will show up and meet you in the course of your life. Lord, that, 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 that fills me with some hope, amen. That, that, that whether I go uh, through the valley, God will meet me. Whether I find myself on the mountaintop, God will meet me. Whether I make my bed in hell, as Brother David said in the Psalms, God will be there. 
Oh, you ought to just come on, give your neighbor a, a, a fake high five and just tell him, I'm so glad that God will meet me wherever I am. And, and it is in this way that the ordinariness of these meeting places that you have with God can turn into a miracle. I mean, the idea that your body is creating miraculous tears to track your journey ought to help you to appreciate that God will never allow one tear you shed to be wasted. I wish I had a jar up in here today. Uh, somebody go find me a jar so I can just put it right here and remind you that the scripture says that God will collect every tear you shed. Woo! Somebody shout hallelujah. And, 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 and it is in this way that I want you then, child of God, to, to be thinking about how can we experience this season of restoration? How can we experience the kind, oh, look, look, look at this jar. I want you to just imagine. Lord, have mercy. I, I, I just want you to imagine that God is literally capturing your tears. Oh, thank God for Pastor Tanisha. Amen. I, I, I want you to, whenever you, you think this week of a tear you're shedding, I want you to imagine God is capturing your tears. And every tear you shed, God is saying, I'm using it as a testimony to track your journey. Oh, Lord, Brother LJ is here. I may preach a little bit today. Amen. 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 Uh, so, so, so one of the first things I want you to, to wrestle with is that if we are going to experience restoration, if we're going to see those moments in our lives recycled for the good, the first thing the text has that you and I must wrestle with is when, when, when. I, I, I'm not even going to read the second part. I'm just going to say when. The, 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 the first idea that you must know, child of God, that your restoration is not, uh, 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 it is not described as if God restores the fortunes of Zion, but it is about when. Somebody say when. What is it saying? It's saying that time is on our side. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that, that, that restoration is not about an if, it's about a when. And how many of you know that there are moments and times in our lives where uh, the delay of restoration can often become the enemy of our expectation? Uh, the, 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 when, I, when I was young, uh, we, we used to hear a song, I don't know if it was James Cleveland, somebody else, said that you can't hurry God. You just got to wait. It was one of them cool JC songs, I think, praise God. <laughs> you you, you got to trust him and give him more time. Amen. Well, what's the next part? Got to trust him and give him more time, no matter how long it takes. Why? Because he's a God. That you can't hurry. But in order for it to rhyme, they said, hurray. Uh-huh. What you think about that, LJ? <laughs> He's a God that you can't hurry. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Why? Because there is an expectation that time is on our side. Whew. I want you to think about the times in our lives where it seems like God is taking too long. It, 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 it's, 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 it's been a long time coming, the wine is used to say. Amen. But a change is going to come. We've been in COVID for a long time. And sometimes it does not even appear that a change is coming. Time is still on our side even when there is a delay. Some of us have been struggling for justice a long time. My, 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 my great-grandparents were struggling for the right to vote. My grandparents struggling for the right to vote. 
My father's struggling for the right to vote. Here in 2021, now I'm struggling for the right to vote. Time, though, is still on the side of the believer. Ooh, I wonder what could you do with that kind of a confidence? That even though some have died, time is still on our side. Even though some relationships have ended in transition, time is still on our side. Even though your health may never get back to the place where you thought it should be, time is still on your side. What does it mean for the child of God to walk around with confidence that regardless of what is going on in my life, time is still on my side? Why? Because God says, when, Lord have mercy, when I restore the fortunes of Zion, God is saying to you and I, we must not lose hold of our confidence. Man, I was, I was, I, my, my daughters, they love to listen to the radio. And man, I can't even listen to my sanctified music, amen, when they get in the car. And this, this song from Drake came on talking about God's plan. God's plan. And I'm listening to the lyrics and I'm saying to myself, man, this brother done reduced God's plan to a cheap hook. <laughs> This brother, this brother done, done made folk think God's plan is, 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 a, is a nice uh, attempt to talk about trivial things in your life. But how many know there's a plan that God has that cannot be reduced or diminished in your life? You ought to just pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm glad I know the real God's plan. Amen. Amen. The kind of plan that, that is not about if a lot of bad things happen and, and people wishing and wishing and wishing, wishing on you bad things. You can wish bad things on me all you want to because the real God's plan cannot be thwarted by the plans of the enemy. And it is in the midst of those plans of God that you and I ought to stand firm with Confidence. So the first question I want you to think about today, as you uh, think about time being on your side, are you learning to trust in God's win? Are we learning to trust in God's win? W-H-E-N, not W-I-N. The win is coming, but are you able to trust in the win? As time is winding down, does your belief trigger hopeful anticipation or does your unbelief trigger disappointed dread just 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 talking about rest restoration today because for many of us we must keep reminding ourselves that time is on our side time is on your side that God will never run out of time. Think about that God lives out of time. God lives on God's own time. Amen. One of the best things I heard about time from uh, the, the uh, African elder, it said, you European-minded folk, y'all live on time, but we live in time. Amen. Uh, so we don't mind, amen, starting whenever we want to because we ain't never on time because time ain't nothing to be a slave to. When you serve the God of all eternity, huh, now don't try that on your job tomorrow, though. You better show up. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Yeah, that we, we, tonight, today we was trying to live in time. Amen. Uh, the, 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 the second thing that I want you to think about, child of God, is that we are able, through the power of God, to see our tears recycled. Somebody just say, recycle your tears. Say it again, recycle your tears. In verse 5, it clearly declares that you that sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Another version says, uh, if you go out weeping, you will return with shouts of victory. I want you to think about this idea that there is a consistent, Sowing with tears, reaping with joy. Sowing with tears, reaping with joy. 
What do your tears tell you about what needs to be recycled in your life? Whew, Jesus. I mean, we, we, we already went through the topography of tears, and I know we may need to spend a little bit more time on that for some of us because it was a little deep for me last night, too. But I want you to think about what do your tears teach you about what you must attend to. Some of us in this season have been gripped by tears of grief and loss. So it means then that our tears are, are inviting us into a time of healing. Mm -hmm. What are your tears teaching you about what needs to be restored? Some of us have experienced tears of joy. So perhaps your tears are telling you that it's time for you to lean into a season of happiness and enjoyment. Uh-huh. Because how many know some of us have had so many bad things happen to us when we cry tears of joy, we can't even enjoy the season. I want you to know that trouble don't last always, child of God. Lord, help me in here today. That if you are a person who has experienced tears of joy, embrace this season of joy as fuel for the journey. Some of us have cried tears that have been triggered by compassion. So perhaps that is inviting you to respond with tenderness and spirit-filled acts of mercy and proximity. If you see the hurting of God's people, compassion that drives you to tears should be seen as an invitation that drives you to action. Oh, don't just be moved to compassion and, and be like, oh, that was, whew. oh, my heart was moved. <laughs> and you don't act. Think of how Jesus walking through Palestine, Judea, the Roman Empire at the time, seeing the hurt of the people. He saw folk who were hungry. He, he, he was capturing the tears. Lord, have mercy. And the tears that Jesus captured moved him to sit folk down and ask folk to bring me some loaves and some fishes. Jesus walking with individuals and folks coming asking Jesus to heal them. Jesus didn't say, hey, I'm, 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 I'm too busy. I, I got so many things to do. But the tears of the sick among Jesus caused Jesus to slow down and even let some folks touch the hem of his garment. Tears of compassion should always lead us to action. Tears of anger. <laughs> you know, growing up in a neighborhood, you were taught as a black man not to cry. Amen. When you were younger and someone bullied you, you know, you get mad enough and sometimes you ball your fist up and you start shaking and a little stream of tear run down your eye. But by the time you became a teenager, in those environments, you realize, I cannot cry. I got to fight back. I got to meet force with force. Or else I will become a prey. I will become a casualty. One of the great challenges for men in, part in general, black men in particular, is that we have not been taught to use the anger that produces tears in a way that is constructive. And so when we get angry, it's Mount Vesuvius up in here. Amen. <laughs> Somebody say amen. When we are told something we don't want to hear, it is not a, a time for us to sit and process. Why are we angry and why are we upset? Tears that are produced by anger is an invitation to process the things that are causing you anger.
and commit, listen to this, to a nonviolent response. Lord, help me to be nonviolent. Amen. I, 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 I tell folk all the time, I believe in nonviolence. Just don't push me, praise God. <laughs> Amen. Because, you know, it's like the David Banner said, you, don't make me angry. You're not going to like me when I'm angry, right? How I many know that's not a biblical theological decree? But some of us say, man, we got, we, we, when it comes to anger, we like David Banner on our way to the Incredible Hulk. But how I many know the Holy, same Holy Ghost that produces joy is the same Holy Ghost that could bridle your anger? My prayer is, Lord, help some of us men to learn how to cry tears of anger. Amen, amen, amen. Fear. Some of us got tears that are results of fear. So the question for us again is how will these tears that are being produced in our life not be wasted? What tears are at risk of being wasted in your life? What tears are not providing you the the, the opportunity to be healed, to explore the joy or the action that is required. What tears in your life can you recycle and exchange for some more anointing, for some more acts of mercy and healing? Somebody say, recycle my tears. And then the last thing I'll say today, don't stop asking for restoration. One of the great formulas of the psalm passages is they repeat themselves as a theme, kind of like our choruses in the church. You have a verse, but then you'll go back to the chorus, and the chorus gets good. Somebody say amen. Amen, amen. You know, we sing song, all these songs, and they were they was four-line songs. Amen. But when you had a musician like LJ, amen, somebody on the drums, and you get through that third or fourth time, how many know some some will hit you in the side, amen? You, you saying the same words. Man, you didn't think up no new words. But something about just repeating a good message over and over again. Lord, help me in here today. Some of us have stopped asking God for restoration because it didn't happen fast enough. But I want you to know God is telling you, don't stop asking. Don't stop crying out for restoration. And I love how the psalmist says, restore our fortunes, Lord, like the streams in the Najib. What, what, what is he saying? You see, the, the writer has a vision. It has a point of reference about what he wants his restoration to look like. He didn't just leave it open-ended. He didn't just say, Lord, restore my fortunes, period. But he said, Lord, restore my fortunes like the waters of Negev. And what that means is that God is asking you and I to think through what kind of restoration do you exactly want? What kind of point of reference are you willing to create? So when I start restoring your fortunes, it ain't something that's happening in the ambiguity of life. No, God, I want you to restore my fortunes like it was in a time when I didn't have to deal with perpetual grief. I want you to restore my fortunes like the waters of the jail. I want you to restore my fortunes uh, like a time when I had abundance and not scarcity. Uh, I want you to restore my fortunes uh, in a time when I was not so racked with pain in my body. Uh, I want you to restore my fortunes uh, like a time in the past when I could move and not feel 
a crook in my side. I want you to restore my fortunes. Like the time when the community came together, when the churches fellowshiped one with another, when we could believe God that though you slay me, yet will I trust in the Lord. Do you have an ask that you're willing to keep putting before God? Do you have a bright red line that you're willing to put in the ground and say, God, I will not take no for an answer. I know there's some things that I've asked of the Lord. And I stopped praying that prayer a long time ago because I realized how trivial it was. But there is an ask that I can't stop asking God to do. There is a request that I can't get out of my mind. There is a need that I need the Lord to say yes to. And if the Lord tells me no today, I'm going to keep coming back tomorrow. And if the Lord tells me, wait, McBride, I'm going to keep coming back the next day because I believe underneath every no, I'm getting closer to God's yes. Underneath every wait just a little while, I'm getting closer to the blessing is on the way. Don't you stop asking whatever you need from the Lord. God says, I will do exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think according to the power that's at work in us. Does anybody got any power? Does anybody got any anointing? Does anybody got a dream? Ask what you will according to the will of God and it shall be done to you. Recycle your tears. Don't let one thing go to waste. Recycle your pain. Don't let that thing go to waste because God wants to restore. God wants to redeem. God wants to save. Save me, Lord. Heal me, Lord. Deliver me, Lord. Shout hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God wants to recycle every one of our tears. God wants to restore every one of your dry places. God wants you to be a person who is never in a space in your journey with God where you feel like you've passed a place of no return. How many know with God there is no place of no return? There's always just a return. Oh, hallelujah, people of the way. Come on, take a few moments and just invite the Spirit of the Lord to remind you that every tear you're crying right now, every tear that you're crying, Every tear that you're crying, God is collecting them in his jar. Every tear of grief, God's collecting it in the jar. Every tear of joy, God's collecting it in the jar. Every tear of compassion, of anger, of fear, of trauma, God is collecting your tears. Hallelujah. And God is saying, I'm going to recycle that tear, that experience. God says, I'm going to redeem it and make it an action of your deliverance and power. So God, in the name of Jesus, every person under the sound of our voice, both in this place today, both experiencing the time of virtual worship. I pray, God, that they all would understand that tears can be recycled, that healing is within our grasp, 
that we can experience restoration. And I pray under the sound of my voice, God, that you will serve a soft reminder or a strong reminder, whatever we need today. The time is on our side. Hallelujah. Remind us, God, that the clock ticking down does not mean that we're running out of time. But a clock ticking down is reminding us that we're getting closer to the when. When you restore the fortunes of Zion, God, we will be like those who dream dreams. We will be like those who experience celebration. So God bless, Lord God, the families, the relationships, the marriages, the children, the jobs, Lord God, the entrepreneurs. Bless every part of our lives, Lord God, that are experiencing this season where time, Lord God, is feeling like an enemy to our progress. Help us to know, God, that, Lord, the, the tears that are being demonstrated in our bodies, God, they're telling a story of redemption. Help us to know, God, that you welcome the tears. Tears are not a sign of unbelief. They are a description of the journey that you have placed us on. Hallelujah. And so, God, may the tears flow through this season of COVID-19. May the tears flow through this season of historic proportional transitions. May the seasons, Lord God, give us an opportunity to be reminded that there is a recycling that you are doing for your glory and your pleasure. So God, we say thank you, Lord. If you're under the sound of my voice, just lift your hands right where you are at home here in the sanctuary and just invite God, Lord, recycle my tears, recycle my pains, recycle my frustrations. What lessons will you have me to learn? You may be here and you've not yet made a decision to follow Jesus. Come on, lift your hands right where you are and say, God, recycle my whole life. Lord God, may every moment of my life be recycled into a salvific experience. Lord, may all the pleasures and the pains, the ups and the downs, may they be a demonstration that you've been there with me all the time. Asha, God, that I've never been walking alone. I just didn't know you were there with me. That your rod and your staff were comforting and covering me. God, I want to say thank you. And we that are followers of the way, God, we come to you now to the table of Eucharistic fellowship. We come to you, God, being reminded that even the death on the cross was not a waste. That the sacrifice you made was not a waste. Hallelujah. But God, you recycled all that the enemy meant for evil and God we now have an eternal gift of salvation that keeps on giving thank you God that it reaches to the highest mountain thank you God that it flows to the lowest valley thank you God that the sacrifice you made for us it never loses its power its efficacy its impact in our lives so on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took his disciples and he brought them together. And he took the bread. And he broke it and he said, this bread is the new covenant I make with you in my blood. This bread is broken for you. And as often as you eat this bread, you are doing so in remembrance of me. He also then took the cup and he blessed it, filled with wine. And he said, this cup is the new covenant I make with you in my blood. For as often as you drink this cup, you do so in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. I want you to take the bread. I want you to take the wine, and I want you to lift it up to the Lord. You may be at home. You may be here. Whatever your elements are, let's lift it up to the Lord and invite the divine sacramental blessing of God. Lord, we want to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the body. Thank you for this sacrifice you made on our behalf. It is a sacrifice that continues some thousands of years later, Lord God, to pull us from the despair of sin and shame. It is a sacrifice that reminds us, Lord, that without the wounds in your body and without the loving sacrifice of your own self, God, the, the paradigm, the efficacy, the work of salvation would be lost among us. This practice of remembering your body and remembering your blood for thousands of years have kept every follower of Jesus in history grounded in this truth that it is one Lord. Hallelujah. It is one faith. It is one baptism. And so, God, we say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the body that is this bread. Thank you for the blood that is this wine. Bless it. May it have the same power it had on the night you gave to your disciples. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray that the people of God say amen. It will never lose its power. Come on, one time. It reaches. Everyone say that it reaches to the highest mountain. And it flows to the lowest valley. And it flows to the lowest valley. Oh, yes. Said it's the blood. Hallelujah. That gives me strength from day to day, say, from day to day. It will never, it will never lose its power. This is the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that has been broken for us. Without the wounds of the Lord, we are not healed, so eat in victory. This is the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that has been shed for us. Without the shedding of blood, the scripture says there can be no remission of sins, no forgiveness of sins, so we thank you for the blood. Drink in victory. Hallelujah. We say thank you, Lord. Come on, everyone. We say thank you, Lord. Come on, say thank you, Lord. And I just want to say, I just want to thank you lord come on tell the lord you've been so good you've been so good we thank you god you've been so so good when i look over my life i can declare you've been so Say it again. I just want to say, I just want, come on, say it again. Say, I just want to thank you. Thank
thank you, Lord. Come on, let's thank God. Let's thank God. We thank the Lord. We thank the Lord. We thank the Lord. We thank the Lord. God bless you, people of the way. On this Sunday, we want to bless God and thank God for you hanging with us. Amen. I pray that you experience a season of restoration all together, all of us together. God's going to restore some things. Amen. You all just put that in the chat. Say, God's going to restore some things. God's going to restore some things. Listen, we are in need of the continued support of all of you the way. Amen. For at least the first 12 to 15 months of our pandemic, we uh, were seeing some very stable giving. Amen. And I can understand how uh, all of us are exhausted by the virtual. Amen. Experience. <laughs> But we got to stay faithful in our giving. And so if you are, are in a place where you can continue your financial commitments to the way, you know what we do here at the way. We don't beg. We don't plead. We don't give you offerings that promise you houses, cars, booze, and mansions. Amen. We just tell you that if you give, God will give it back to you. Press down, shake it together, and run it over. How many know that when you are generous, generosity finds you? Amen. And the practicality of supporting the way means that we can continue to keep our church in a space and a place of fiscal solvency, that we can uh, maintain our staffing and mercy ministries and, and even the expansion of our church. Amen. Uh, the way Los Angeles is doing amazing. Amen. And we are continuing to support them. Amen. We have the way Berkeley. We're, we're still trying to figure out the way. Amen. Oakland. Amen. And, and, and someone even asked us about a way San Francisco. Amen. And, and so there's all kind of folk asking about the way. Amen. And I, and I said, well, you know, let's, let's just keep the way going. Amen. And uh, we'll ask about the other ways. Amen. <laughs> Maybe in 2022, somebody say amen. <laughs> but we need your support and we need your help. And so please be very uh, generous in your giving. Go to the Waze website and give uh, you in the virtual space or mail your checks to the church. I, I got to make a confession. I thought that uh, our, 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 our automatic giving was set up. And so we haven't been given in a whole year, amen. And so I had, to, I had to cobble my little pennies together and put my first down payment in for my makeup tithe. Somebody say amen. Amen. Because I ain't trying to rob God up in here, amen. They don't want to be asking y'all to give. And, and, and unbeknownst to us, amen, my gift, our gift had not been coming in. And so we're asking all of us, let's, let's, let's continue to do what we can. We are never asking for your rent, never asking for your food. Never asking for your car payment or notes, but what you can give, do it consistently and be generous. And we know that God will continue to bless God's people in the name of the Lord. Do we have any announcements that we need to say or we'll put it all on the stream, I suppose? Listen, people of the way, we have a special Facebook members page that we would love to welcome you all to join so we can continue to have some uh, regular engaging conversations offline away from the view of the general public. And so find The Way Facebook members group. Uh, our minister, uh, 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 Teresa, uh, is, is holding that part down for us. And so she's going to be posting lots of messages regularly. Again, we will be having a special Bible study series that I'll be leading every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, sign up for that, uh, and we'll post the, the, the video link, or I'm sorry, the sign-up link, on my page and on uh, the Ways Facebook page so you can join in. God bless you. We love you with the love of the Lord. Uh, we'll see you next week in Jesus' name. God bless. God bless. God bless.